You may have been dreaming about having a home birth when you were first planning your pregnancy. And then when you learned you were having twins, that vision may have just gone out the window. Perhaps your doctor told you that delivering twins outside of a hospital is too risky, but is it? What is the real evidence for determining what is safe for you and your babies? Today, we're talking with Dr. Victoria Flores, a fully licensed, obstetrically trained physician who has attended over a thousand births and about a hundred out of hospital. And we're going to talk about evidence-based considerations for twin home births. This is Twin Talks. The ultrasound shows your babies to be healthy. What? Did you say babies? You're huge. Are you having twins? Are they natural? Which one do you like better? Twins, huh? My neighbor's cousin's brother's uncle's a twin. So can they read each other's minds? How do you tell them apart? Twins? You got a two for one. Do twins run in your family? Double trouble. You're not having any more, are you? At least you're not Octomom. If you're pregnant with twins or you're an experienced twin parent, odds are you've heard it all before. Now it's time to hear from the experts. This is Twin Talks, Parenting Times 2. Welcome to Twin Talks. My name is Christine Stewart Fitzgerald, and I'm your host. I have identical twin girls who are now in their teens and a singleton girl that's three years younger and who is firmly stands out on her own. Um, And I personally wanted a less medicalized birth experience for for both my pregnancies, and um, I sought out supportive medical providers, but I ended up delivering in a hospital for both occasions. So I'll talk a little bit more about my experience with Dr. Flores in a bit. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button in your podcast app to make sure you get the latest content. You can also get updates about new episodes from Twin Talks and other great parenting shows by subscribing to our weekly newsletter at newmommymedia.com. And if you're interested in getting an inside look at our show, then check out our membership club called Mighty Moms. It's where we chat more about the topics discussed here in the show, and it's a great way to suggest topic ideas or even to let us know that you'd like to be a guest on an upcoming episode. Well, let's meet our expert today, Dr. Victoria Flores. She is an obstetrically trained physician and has quite an interesting career journey that began with her family roots. So Dr. Flores, could you share with us just a little bit about your story and how you became so passionate about obstetrics and um, just, you know, you bring such a unique perspective. Well, hello there. So, hi, Christine. I'm really glad that you brought me on because, you know, we're going to talk about a topic that is so um, hidden in the shadows almost of the birthing community. It is such a taboo topic um, in the modernized obstetrical industrial complex. And I was um, enchanted by birth, as many women are, as they're growing up with their baby dolls and their family bringing home new babies. And then um, going through school during a period of time where women um, began to acknowledge inequities amongst ourselves as professionals. Um, It made me aspire to doing something for the female community. Um, And I and I had a personality that was very feminized um, and wanting to help women as well. And so I remember going home um, for the first time from college and kind of telling my parents, hey, you know, I've heard about you know, this thing called obstetrician and delivering babies, you know, I'm thinking I want to deliver babies too. Um, And my parents, never thinking that I was interested in medicine at that time, were like, well, you know, you have to become a doctor. Then I was like, oh yeah, no big deal. Like, that's just like, (laughs) no big deal. (laughs) Like, no big deal. Like, I'm just going to deliver babies. Like, I'll get the thing, I'll get the MD and I'll move on. Right. So very unaware of the, the system that I was trying to overcome and um so many women that are in midwifery school or that are aspiring to also deliver babies sometimes ask me should you go through medical school just to be able to deliver babies and now that i am on the other side of it um and have become and I'm going to say this and I know it's going to piss some people off, but a a little bit more um, unbrainwashed from what the initial teachings were, I am able to say that, no, you don't need to become a doctor to know what's necessary to have a safe birth, vaginal birth. You just don't. But um, the, the knowledge in the majority of cases does end at the hospital training. And that's just the system because it is to 
to create people that work within it and stay in it, not get beyond it and progress it in any other direction. Like it's a, it's a, it's a system made for commerce and economy and it supports many people's positions and jobs and stockholder, you know, values. So, um, it's just, it ends there. But mm -hmm. I, um, went through school, undergraduate school, knowing that I had to to become a doctor in order to deliver babies and so I did I became a doctor I went to medical school I went into residency and I don't know if you can relate but there's sometimes like a a sensation that you get in your life where you realize that your spiritual body is not necessarily aligning with what your physical body is doing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like this um, this logical um, need to will the body through something that is difficult. And I have always been also a very spiritually aware person, someone who's been a part of the communities that discuss the spiritual body as well as the physical body and you know mm -hmm. both things fascinate me um which i thought would be great to become a doctor and you know both would be acknowledged but absolutely not it's like you're treated like like a little robot that needs a little oil here and there and you'll you'll get back into gear and start you know chugging along as normal as a human being but that's you know not the way the body works but that's how the the system treats the body um so i remember getting that feeling of this is weird. I don't understand why we're doing so much for a baby to come out of a mama. Like this doesn't make mm. sense. It's an intuitive. This is not feel like the way it's supposed to be. And yet I had the education to show me these quote unquote dangers of childbirth. Um, and you know, when you don't know what you don't know, you take in what's handed to you and you say, yes, and you don't ask for more because you kind of don't realize that there is more, right? Because you don't know what to search for. However, I did have that feeling that it just wasn't right. Some of those indicators were, I just didn't have a lot in common with the people um, that I was training with. Um, I really have a lot of friends and a, a lot of really close people in my life that have been there for decades, but I just could not jive with I would say most of the personalities that were in the L and D ward just mm -hmm. it just didn't click. And um, you were you, you know, were the maverick, right? <laughs> I I don't know if it's maverick or not. I mean, there was always some overseeing attending that would have some excuse for why people didn't you know want me to succeed in that realm, and they they would say some really really kind things. And you know, it's hard because I hate talking about myself, but I would say they would say things like, "Oh, you you're you're just intimidating them," or you you know you come with a different set of knowledge that might might not make them feel comfortable talking about that. And, you know, it was just really hard to, um, it's, it's just hard to talk about myself, first of all, and you're making me do that. <laughs> and then, but, um, but basically I felt very confident in the things that I was able to do and know. And it was very hard to teach people around you that are in higher hierarchical positions um, that they're missing something or maybe they're they're wrong about something or they don't want to hear it because that's just not your job to teach up. You only get to teach down stream, right? So um, there was just a lot of friction. And when things are friction, I've always heard that's life telling you like, maybe this isn't necessarily what you're supposed to do. And so instead of like initially jumping ship, I was much more like, okay, let me see what I can learn from this and get beyond it. Cause perhaps that's what the lesson is. I just need to learn something to get through this. And I tried everything. Let me tell you all the things that all the doctors do when they're unhappy in the field. Um, you know, talking to people, trying to convince myself that it's better on the other side, um, hypnotizing myself with, you know, desires of the future and those types of things. And then nothing really got me to the other side. Like it just, it didn't. So at one point in my fourth year, I did have to just throw up my hands and say, okay, I am a chief resident. I did 
a great job. I've been at so many births. I think I had logged 800 by then with the ACGME, which is the medical um, is there's a council that you have to log your births with so you can prove that you've done so many um, vaginal births. I think you're mm -hmm. supposed to do only 200 before you graduate and then um, another 200 or so cesareans or maybe 150. I think it's 200 cesareans. I'm sorry. And like and this was when I was there, and about 250 vaginal. So about equal, which shows you the value system of that education is that they value both equally. Um, so there was incentive to do cesareans because you should have just as many cesareans on graduation, right? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I never even, so I mean, we know that sometimes there can be a financial incentive, but even you're saying even as a resident, it's like, yeah. oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm low on my cesarean, so yep. I need to bump up the number. <laughs> so you do get influenced 100% like that. Like I remember there was this one resident that would put on um, good luck breech earrings because anytime a breech would come in, she'd get a C-section and she could knock that and the goal is to finish your numbers so you can say you've done them and move on right so so that is a part of it like hello like there needs to be incentives for everyone to go forward and that's that's the token system that they give the residents in training wow wow yeah. Yeah. And so it just sounds like, so you were, you know, a little bit, I mean, I'll just say, you know, disillusioned, you're really tuned in to kind of your, your own gut and your own sense of, of what's right, you know, not just for yeah. yourself and your passion and what you wanted to do, but, but also for just offering women, you know, expectant mothers, different birth choices and knowing, Hey, this, this experience that they're having as, as a patient really shouldn't be like this. This is not, it's just not jiving for you as it as a provider. So I, I could see that, that you're, that was probably the, the beginning um, early on of wanting something different for them. Yes. I remember very distinctly um, the, um, you know, don't, don't spend too much time with patients. I have things to do. I need you to see them quickly, get here, tell me what's wrong, what you're going to do about it, and then let me leave as your supervisor so that I can do what I have to do. So it's, a, it's, it's you know, passed down the pressures of um, what needs to be done for the day. And I know every institute is different. I was lucky enough to work with two because um, I thought that it was going to be more successful for me to get beyond that friction at another institute. And it just wasn't, it was just a different format. It's funny. It wasn't the, the, um, the co-residents that I had any issues with. We loved each other and we still, you know, communicate, but it was more of a, um, a systems thing where like you learn one thing in one hospital and it doesn't necessarily fit the format at another hospital. So it, it, I knew that I was fine. And then when I did get out, I got to practice with Dr. Stuart Fishbein. And he thought I was so good and exceptional compared to my peer group that he basically said, I'm going to teach you how to run this practice and I'm going to go and you're going to take over because I have full confidence that you're going to be fine. And he's still my partner. Um, and anyone that I decide to bring on or that he decides to bring on, he can vouch for and say that I am doing just what he would do in those situations. We have, we're almost like copies of each other in that regard. So it's, I had the validation from the people that mattered and I was lucky enough to have the insight that I knew whose opinion mattered. Um, and I also had the self-confidence and the rebel energy that you're talking about to kind of, um, put aside any, um, haters that were going to hate no matter what, right? And I realized that there's many reasons for friction to occur, not necessarily truth, but it could also be um, spiritual body friction, just like not agreeing with someone's style or someone's vernacular or someone's, um, you know, choice of hair and makeup or whatever. Like there's so many things that go into what makes someone fit into a culture. And um, when you see me, I definitely look look um, different than some of the OBs. Not that there's anything <laughs> wrong. I just, I'm just very, very um, small, petite, and girly, um, as are so many OBs. I'm not saying that none of them are. I'm just saying that. It was hard for me to fit into the culture that I was given. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. So now fast forward today, I mean, you have, just tell us a little bit about your, your current practice and who you're serving now. Great. So um, I currently work in Calabasas, California, because that's where Dr. Stu finished his practice at. So I just took it over because a lot of people ask me why I do it there. Um, and um, it is a wonderfully balanced group of midwives in one practice, as well as me. We all work out of the same 
office space. And um, it's mostly what we call the midwife model. And so the midwife model means that every visit isn't like what you would see in the medical model where you check in and you go sit in a waiting room and you wait for your number to be called and then you get sat into a room and then someone who's not your doctor does your vital signs and then someone who's not your doctor um, does your initial visit like questions and then hands them off to a doctor who comes in, answers the questions that you have, tells you everything's fine, maybe does a quick this and that check on your abdomen so that it feels like they did something they could bill for um, and then um, gets on out of the room and good luck. Why don't you go read this book to fill in any other missing information and goodbye. And then you get, you know, you've been there for an hour. You've seen your doctor for three minutes. You've been waiting for 30 minutes. We've all had those experiences in the normal system. And then you leave like, okay, I can't believe I'm paying a thousand dollars a month of insurance for my family for me to get this kind of care. And it's just really disheartening. But in the midwife model, no, it is a little bit more um, pay out of your pocket in the system that I worked in, but you get a full hour, you get loved on, you get tea when you arrive, you get um, a living room format, you see the doctor initially upon arriving and it's your appointment. So there's like no one in the waiting room, it's just you and your family. And um, you get taken into this beautiful room with a lush, cozy couch to sit on and you feel much more relaxed and at ease when your vitals are being done right in front of the physician. So, and if they need to be repeated, the physician will repeat them right there and, um, or they'll do them first off the bat. So you're, you're being treated by the person who you're choosing to care for you the entire time. Like, it's not like you get to see them for a second. Then, um, after doing, you know, the initial visit that you would get, um, you think you're getting where we ask all those basic questions of fetal movement, um, weights, um, any signs of preterm labor, those basic stuff. We also, um, we have our own education period, um, in that visit where we discuss what you should have expected up until this point. It's called anticipatory guidance, what you're going to anticipate for the next visit, what's going to happen between there. And then we also do some emotional work, like what's going through your mind? What are you feeling about pregnancy? What are you feeling about childbirth? Breaking down some of those fears that society has put into you and um, empowering the woman to know that this is, this is what she's going to do. And she's going to do great no matter what the outcome is. Um, if she's putting herself in the control seat, she's going to be fine and left without the trauma that you would get if you're just being whisked off and told what to do. And then at the end of the day, there's regrets. Who are you going to blame? You can't blame yourself in that setting because it wasn't your choice. But in the midwife model, those are your choices. And we give women the knowledge and the power to make the choices. Also knowing that complications are very, very rare, especially amongst women that know what to look for, like midwives and myself. Um, and so there's not really as huge of a risk as people would think that there is yeah. and that they're told that there is. Yeah. Yes. yes. So Dr. Flores, thanks for sharing your story. I mean, I'm, I am so glad to have you here with us today. And so, you know, for our listeners, we're talking with Dr. Victoria Flores, who is here to help us better understand um, really about home births and learn about um, actual risks versus perceived risks and, and what it's like to have um, a home birth versus a hospital birth. So let's dive in. And I, I think for some of our listeners, um, they may not really know what to expect from, from a home birth. And I mean, I think you, you know, you touched on, you're starting to talk about a little bit, the, um, the midwifery model and, um, you know, really what is that as it applies to a home birth? Like what could twin parents expect, um, from, from a home birth? And I mean, like, you know, obviously it's at home, but, but aside from that, how is it different than getting care at a hospital? So, um, I would say that the most important part about home birth or hospital or out of hospital birth, community birth is how we say it if you're a part of the community, um, is that we put the mother in the driver's seat. And that's something that not all women want because we have not been talk taught about childbirth and child rearing in our current society. Like it's something that's kind of held away from our secular world. Like it's just not talked about because it's considered unfeminist, right? It's not mm -hmm. a part of that model of um, society. And so it's a secret. And, but there's a curiosity that women have, right? 
but we kind of just um, ignore it. But when we get to a point where someone's pregnant, there are a, a percentage of people that do want to um, have authority or know what's happening in their body so that they can make decisions because they've either heard of traumatic outcomes in a hospital before, especially in the black community. Um, women that are of color or black women specifically are very afraid to birth in a hospital because their rates of maternal death are so much higher than with, and also neonatal death are so much higher than they are with any other population, honestly. Um, and um, yeah, so it's just women that really want to be in the driver's seat and not be, and, um, and that want to be heard, that don't want right. to be um, poo-pooed. When they right. do make a suggestion and say that they feel something, they don't want it to be said, oh, that's normal. Like they want to mm -hmm. go down the path of what it could possibly be. And if it's normal, fabulous, but like, let's talk about what it possibly could be too. You know, they want that control. Yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so now thinking in, in terms of specifically twins, I mean, you know, I, I think the, well, tw twins are just overwhelming. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, when, <laughs> so does it start, so does, you know, obviously we're looking at having the, the actual birth at home and does the care begin at home? Like, is there prenatal care? Is that it in a clinical setting or is that in a home setting? Like what happens like leading up to the actual birth? So every midwife and myself and Stu and any out community practitioners are very different. So some people and doulas too, they, they, they have you come into an office, they have their hour long visit with you. Everything is so nice, warm and cozy. And then you'll begin um, getting a home visit around, you know, the time when you could go into labor, 37, 38 weeks, you get your visit at home. Um, and then you maybe go into labor in the next two weeks and you don't have to go into the office. But once you have your baby, everyone goes to your home has the baby you also get your postpartum visits in your own bed because oh, that's huge training, yeah, oh my geez. gosh I mean so I can training, say, yeah I, I remember off to say just you know coming for that that week you know the week visit and like having to bundle up twins in the terrible. infant carriers and get in the car and I'm still like sore everywhere and just show just showing up was was it was a huge amount of effort and I'm just exhausted you know just to, just to be there and then you get your maybe 15 minutes if you're lucky right you know yes. going out so oh that like having postpartum at home like that would that would have sold it for me <laughs> absolutely yes <laughs> totally exactly so um so just like you're saying, like when you're at home, you get someone to come in to see you at 24 to 48 hours, someone to see you maybe at a week, maybe you need extra time to, for someone to come and see you on the second week because there was, you know, a little bit more blood loss at your delivery or they needed to do a, a vaginal repair or something at the delivery of perennial laceration repair. Um, and, um, and then you get checked right there without leaving the house and, and it is for the comfort of the mother and for her, her joy. It really is. And then you also get your um, breastfeeding recommendations and your education there. Um, there's um, so much partnership in the community. I think a lot of people don't realize that m almost all of us are like friends at some level, like just we are professional friends, but we know each other and we can recommend each other and we all um, have an awareness of each other's special skills and strengths and we utilize what's around us um, to cater to you and to make more of a boutique experience, which is so and so joyful compared to this medical model where no one really is going to know your name. Nobody really is going to be remembered. So they kind of get away with being rude sometimes, or even if they are nice, it's, it, it doesn't feel like you get to connect at a, at a more than superficial level. And now there are some women that don't mind that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there are some women that feel um, unsafe without that rapport. And so yeah. to have the continuity of the provider which is no longer something that really happens in a hospital now, right? With the laborist, it's just whoever's on mm -hmm. call whoever's that night. On call. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. But in our model, you know who you're going to get. Um, and you do have to put a little bit more money up front because of that, because that person's going to build their life around your 
due dates, right? Mm -hmm. So that they have to be able to tell their whole family that there's a two month period of time where they are not leaving their house. So you know what I mean? Or the area at all. So there is, so it's a lot, it's more to be given, but it's also so much more um, joyous for the practitioner. Right. Now, you know, you mentioned when we talk about practitioners and providers, um, so, you know, we, we hear a lot of different terms for, you know, different birth providers. I mean, we hear doctors, physicians, doulas, midwives. Um, so maybe you can explain a little bit what are, what are the different roles um, that they would be playing in a home birth? Okay, so there. So let's begin, I guess, with the physician. So the physician um, would be someone like me or Dr. Stu or Dr. Hayes. Um, Dr. Fabi um, out in um, LA with me. There's a, a few other practitioners that do occasional home births. Dr. Crane, um, he, he might be, not be doing those anymore, but um, he's out in LA too. I know some people that are in Puerto Rico and, you know, the rare physician that can be, um, can be asked to do it. So they go to home births. Often they bring an ultrasound. Often they bring uh, maybe NST capabilities. So doing continuous fetal monitoring if they if someone opts for that for a period of time or if there's a questionable period of whether or not things should continue at home, um, they can they have access to those monitors. But they're never really needed, honestly. We can do home births without any of that stuff, but they're available because those people know how to use them. Um, the next degree um, of person that could be at a home birth is your midwife. And the midwife, there's two different types of midwives. There's um, licensed, certified professional midwives. Those are what we call um, apprenticeship trained midwives. So they learn by other midwives and they have a midwifery school. They still have to meet certain criteria, take a test and everything, but they're learning it in the community model, which is beautiful. And then there's also the certified nurse midwife, which is the ones that are trained in the hospital model. So they become RNs first. They know how to draw blood first. They know how to basically um, do all the obstetrical stuff on L&D because they have to do that rotation in order to finish their RN. And then they decide beyond their RN that they want to, to learn specific L and D as a midwife, and and then they have to um, learn how to work with physicians and making decisions. And so it's it's a hospital based education, not a community based education. But they're still called midwives because that's what the um, industry decided they should be called. Um, but it's a different it's a different type of midwife. Okay, so we can't say that all midwives are the same. Okay, um, then gotcha. there's also yeah, and there's also lay midwives out there which are even more special. Those are midwives that decided that they don't want to go through the licensing route and they are really valid beautiful birth workers who are using more anciently um governed forms of um, prenatal care and it really is care and birth care so um one story i heard is that there there was these um, doulas that were going to africa and they wanted to meet the midwives of these um african tribes that have done you know tens of thousands of deliveries and have never had a maternal death never had a, you know like anything extreme happen and they were like so impressed by these women that they wanted these doulas wanted to gift them something and so what they did is they made these little prenatal kits that they could give them because they thought that in their Western minds that these could benefit these midwives. They had like fundal height tape. They had um, urine dipsticks. They had blood pressure cuffs. They had, you know, um, scopes like um, to listen to baby's heart rates and things like that. Maybe even little watches. But when the midwives were given those, when they, the African midwives, they looked at everything and were like, this is hilarious. We don't need any of this. Like we <laughs> use our hands. We know exactly what normal is. We can feel if there's enough fluid because we can tell by the tautness uh, of the fluid how the baby's bouncing around in the belly side to side. They can tell how the mom's blood pressure is by just palpating her vessels and seeing if they're throbbing. They don't if they're looking technology, for technology, right? They're right. Just, so, no, but the thing is that hands. <laughs> they have got their hands and, and, and we have that technology as well, but we should be augmented by the modernness of the measuring machines and components and instruments, right? Like we are not supposed to rely on them. And so um, it was just a great reminder that there are women out there that are holding these beautiful traditions um, and they're practicing a little bit underground, but they are doing a great job or else they would absolutely be on the front of every newspaper and in jails and you would hear outcry beyond what we're hearing for, you know, these maternal deaths that are happening in the hospital setting. Yeah. 
Uh, no, I, I no. There's huge, huge, huge incentives to to really to again. I think to manage it, and you know, I know that's the other thing. I guess I have to ask is um, so when when twin parents. Um, you know, first talk to their doctor and, and really, I mean, come on, like what 99% of all twin births are in a hospital setting. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you have all the statistics, so it's probably, yeah, it's yeah. probably less than 1% I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, but you know, and, and even at the hospital setting, um, I'm sure you've probably got the statistics for twin births. I mean, most of them are probably more medicalized surgical births or, yeah induced um so so few of them. 90 percent cesareans 90 90 percent cesareans yes 90 percent wow. that's just that's just incredible so so only 10 percent of all twin births right now are vaginal delivery and in a then, hospital in a hospital <laughs> right wow. exactly and it's and it's not because they they didn't try with more initially i'm sure there was probably 60% maybe that were attempting vaginal birth, but you know how easy it is to not know anything about birth and then to be told that something's happening and for the op- option for cesarean to be offered and for it to to be given to you with non-blinking, staring eyes saying, do you want your babies to live, right? The threat, oh, the coercion. Yes. Oh, right? I've heard that. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. And so no, I know exactly you say, what you're saying. Yes, because you don't <laughs> want the social stigma and it has nothing to do with the truth of the matter or the probabilities of the matter or the balance of your education versus the education of your physician or the power discrepancy. It's about, oh my God, I can't not do something for my baby. It moves into the emotional influence in that Absolutely. regard. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to look at what a twin birth might look like and what are the actual risks that are involved. Welcome back to Twin Talks. Before the break, we were talking with our twin birth expert, Dr. Victoria Flores, about options for twin births. Um, so we, we started to talk about some of the risks that the, a lot of the, the obstetricians warn us about. Um, so Dr. Flores, can you give us kind of an alternate perspective to what we've been hearing? Um, and I know we've t- been talking about hospital births right now, um, but just but just in general, I mean, you know, do we have kind of a comparison or what, what what's, you know, if you compare hospital births versus home births, because everybody is going to say, oh, home births, just it's not an option. It's scary. You know, um, so w- what would your response to that be? So home birth for twins is pretty much not a viable option because of the unfortunate case that there's not many twin providers, not because it can't happen, but just because the providers don't exist or the practitioners don't exist. Mm -hmm. But there are, and what for us in California, there was a time when midwives did attend home births for twins. Mm -hmm. And in 2014, there was legislation that was passed to give them access to certain types of home births, such as feedback births, which have a 90% success rate at home and only a 45% success rate in the hospital, that those options would be given to those those midwives in exchange for not accepting to deliver twins at home. And because twins were so rarely delivered at home anyway, it was a loss that the midwives were willing to exchange when they had to come to terms with a bill to pass for their um, freedom to deliver VDACs at home, which is a much higher percentage of women in the population. So the the politics of it are so real. It's not because the midwives couldn't do it. They had to play the game of politics. That's crazy. And so I know we're talking California. We've got listeners um, all around right. the country and, and into other countries as well. We are international twin podcast. Um, but so I, I, I guess what I'm hearing is that the you know the, one of the reasons that we really don't hear much about twin home births is just simply because a there aren't very there are very few providers who can either legally do it or who are willing to do it or have the the training to do that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, And I will tell you that from experience, the training in a community hospital training setting for residents um, is there's just not that many twins to go around for everybody. 
like if there's a 12 to 20 percent program um maybe everyone got maybe four or five twin deliveries um during their entire training um and it it, it's just the way that it is in that community setting. Now, if you go to like a more academic setting, there are more twins, but guess what else is in the academic setting? MFM mm -hmm. fellowships. So the MFM fellows are the ones that often get those cases and the residents do not get to actually manage the twin labors. So having any OB who's not an MFM does not guarantee that they have experience at all with twins. Mm, okay, Isn't that crazy? gotcha. There's so yeah. much to it. There's so much to it. <laughs> and as you know, a twin, I just remember in all my um, parent, you know, our prenatal care, it was extremely um, just data based. I mean, right, yep. related on, you know, I remember going into my, my checks and of course we're measuring for fluid levels and, you know, measuring, you know, you know, the fetal monitor heart rates and we're measuring, it was, it was all data driven. And I was lucky if I got to see um, you know, my, um, my specialist for, you know, five or 10 minutes. Um, and like you said, there was, there was no touching. They didn't, they didn't, you know, feel my belly. They didn't, you know, say, you know, what's, what's going on. It was just, it was all looking at, okay, we, we got the data, the data, here's the stats. Okay. You're good to go. <laughs> so right. it, right. just, um, it, did, it didn't feel connected. So exactly. I, I, I just totally get you on that. Um, that it's just in, in dealing with the midwife, it's when, you know, there's, there's really something about working with a provider who is, um, really using the, the power of touch yeah. and has that, um, really in, intuitive sense. I mean, I know personally I've worked with, um, other sort of body work providers. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is such an incredible thing when a provider can you can literally just, you know, touch me and understand there's this, this knowledge going on of what needs to be done. Right. Um, and you know, whether it's, I mean, I've worked with, you know, like either chiropractors or um, different kinds of, you know, healing therapists. And it's just, I mean, and, and it's such an, a really incredible thing, just the, the healing yeah. power of touch. So, I totally um, agree. <laughs> totally agree. so yeah. no, to you just, yeah, to your, to your point, it's, it's a different, it's a different function. And I think in the twins world, I mean, we're, we are certainly grateful to have those, uh, the people who are, who understand, you know, what the, the, the ideal, you know, and what normal levels of, you know, everything, what the readings should be, what the standards of care should be. But, but I think we also want to have that human connection as well. So let me ask you, I mean, right now we probably have, you know, a lot of listeners that are, um, you know, have, have pretty good relationship with their provider, and their provider saying, okay, you know, hey, this is, you know, you need to have, you know, the hospital birth or, um, and maybe, you know, we'll, we'll allow you to um, try a natural birth, either meaning vaginally and or um, non-medicated, um, if that's their, their choice. Um, but um, I, I guess, you know, maybe can you share a little bit about what, what should our, you know, twin moms what kind of conversations can they have with their providers if they, if they want a more, I don't know, a woman centric um, approach? Okay. So what can they ask for? So, okay. So one of the things I had to also learn was the word allow it shouldn't really be in maternal care. Like if people shouldn't allow you to do what you want to do, you should be asking for what you want. So you say, you know what? My intention is to have a vaginal delivery with these twins. And if they say, well, we'll see if you're allowed to on that day, you just say, no, 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 I don't need you to allow me. I'm an adult and can make my own decisions. I want you to tell me what the risks and benefits of each choice are and be honest about them and perhaps provide literature if I need it in order to believe you or point me in the direction to find it. And then I will make the decision and ask you to support me along my path. Mm -hmm. And that's wow. difficult because, right, that means that somebody has to be willing to question a person who 
society has scripted as the authority in a hospital world. Now that's not the case in the midwife world. In the midwife world, it immediately gives women the option to hear the risks, benefits, and alternatives of all the options and then decide with whoever they're working with, what's the best for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so, so let me ask you, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's a very brave, bold thing to do. Um, and you know, I, I guess, you know, with, with, with twins, I mean, we're always told, well, you know, you're, you're high risk pregnancy, you're high risk, you know, you're, you're not, you know, we, we just, we, we don't know. We want to, um, just, you, you never know, you know, the kind of that thing, like, you know, we want to make sure there, there's a small chance of, of X happening and well, we just want to make sure that that's not possible. And so how, how would <laughs> you respond to that? Impossible, right? <laughs> nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. And there is a risk to every decision that's being made, except that it seems that the, the system has um, created um, a priority for one life over the mothers. And so there are some people who want to know what the risk is to the mother as well as to their babies. But what we always talk about the risk to the babies mostly, honestly. Um, but women that have a lot of babies already at home, they have to get home. And so maybe they need to prioritize their life in a situation so that their family is taken care of no matter what happens to the current pregnancy, right? So it's really, really, really hard to choose martyrdom um, and occasionally that does happen. Like cesareans are the ways, are, are one of the ways that we see people dying in maternal health care that do show up on the news because they shouldn't have happened, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that have the clots that were misdiagnosed. And they're not physicians' fault. I will say that. It's the system's fault. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to acknowledge that you're in the system when you're going to choose to have hospital birth. So even if your physician is remarkable and caring and doing rounds and taking their time um, and has a low patient load, if you're in the system, you're reliant on nursing, you're reliant on dietitians, you're reliant on the, the other people that are in the hospital too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's just, that's just so, so challenging. So I guess, cause so kind of, since we got to kind of wrap this up here. So let me ask you if, if, if home births, you know, really, um, are not option. I mean, what, what options do we have? How can families explore different options, different providers? What's the best way to go about and, you know, look at what's available in their area for the type of care that really is more, a woman and family centered? Well, everyone can have co-midwifery care if they still want to include the hospital for the majority of their care as well. So you can always go and find a midwife and say, hey, look, I know you can't deliver twins at home because of the laws, but I still think I would benefit from the knowledge, education, and um, style that you're going to care for me that you know, I would rather have experience with than the hospital, or I would like to have both, or just being able to ask a midwife what they recommend. And you know, some midwives, they know people that do twin home births because they're, like I said, there's a community of out of hospital birth workers that know each other and can point you in certain directions. And you can always ask for a few referrals from different clients that they've had in the past. So you can talk to them about those people's experiences. You can always look the medical board up and see if anyone has anything against them to see if there's something that you need to worry about. Um, and people usually find people through word of mouth when it comes to twin home birthing. It's like, you don't even need to know about that until you get to that wall. And when you get to that wall, you can start your search. If that's what you're so called to do, if you're ready for that type of birth experience, there's a Instagram page called twin home birthing. There's, um, currently one of our, my friends, um, global midwife 360, I believe she, um, is a uh, medicine without borders midwife that delivers, so many people in um, disenfranchised areas in Africa, but then half of the year she comes here. She just did a set of triplets at home. And it's not much different than caring for twins, except that she has the guts to have done it because I don't think she's worried about wow. licenses. Because when, um, you know, like I said, it's kind of underground 
It's just the way it is. People know who to go to. There, there are conferences. There's the Twin Breach Conference where it's mostly home birth workers that's go, that goes on occasionally. This is the second year it's gone on. It's going to happen in Kentucky with Dr. Nathan Riley. I'm holding Twin Breach Conferences. They're spinning babies. They talk about breaches. They talk about twins. But it's kind of like you do have to be in the know. But I said a lot of terms right now that can start people off. So spinning babies, Nathan Riley, um, Laura, what's her last name? Well, she's the Global Midwife 360 that did triplets. You can Google that. Um, you could look me up, Dr. Stewart on Birthing Instincts. He's my partner. Um, and that the Instagram page that I was telling you about. And when you reach out to those mothers individually or to the people that run those pages, they can usually connect you to the person that they're posting about even if they're not giving you a direct link to that person, you can still find a way to get to them. Okay. No, that's great. And you know what? We can put the links on our website um, for this okay. episode. So please you know, check it out because we want to make sure that yeah, it's easy to find. Those are all sounds like some really great resources. Um, so that's just really super helpful. So I have to say, this has been such an insightful discussion and I, I really feel like I learned something new every time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Dr. Flores, for, for bringing forward just, just such great, important information. And, and we just don't get it anywhere else. Um, and so if everyone wants to learn more, so please do check out newmommymedia.com where we'll be um, posting all the links um, for this episode. And we'll have all of our podcast episodes plus videos and more. That wraps up our show for today. Thanks for listening. If you like Twin Talks as much as we do, please consider checking out the amazing businesses that sponsor our show week after week. And we'd also love for you to tell other twin parents about this resource, which of course is absolutely free. And if you want to check out some of our other parenting podcasts, such as Newbies, it's everything about newborns, Parent Savers, think parenting hacks, The Boob Group, The Lowdown on Breastfeeding, and Preggy Pals, everything you could possibly need to know about pregnancy then visit our website at newmommymedia.com. Thanks for listening to Twin Talks, Parenting Times 2. This has been a New Mommy Media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care, and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.